Hey guys, Breakman79 here, and welcome back to Let's Play Planscape Torment, where we're still stuck in this blasted, zombie-infested place. Let's see, maybe we can actually... Riddling. Is this guy the same one we met before? Oh, huh? Villain, ruining my fun, damn the Bator. I would spit it the had I any. Hmm. Skeleton turns its head away from you. Yeah. I'm gone. I see. I am I gonna have to talk to every freaking person I find? Ghoul, ghoul. Yeah. Jeez. Done. Skeleton. <laughs> Nameless zombie. I don't think I've just talked to you. This rotting female corpse is shaking her head and moaning sadly. As you approach her, she turns and holds her hands out to you as if asking for aid. Okay, what's up? Forgot my name. The zombie moans softly in reply. Only your skills at conversing with the dead allow you to understand her. Name. My name. No. Is that why you're so distressed? Forgot my name. My name. Her milky eyes well with a black, roomy substance. A corpse's only tears. Okay, can I help you find your name again? The corpse nods slowly. My tomb. She points southward. Wait, what? Watery catacombs. But how will I know it? Updated my journal. Chest. Spiked chest. Bolted down near my tomb. Huh. Why don't you just choose a new name? She just, she stands there, watching you silently. Did you understand? You can choose a new name. She shakes her head, backing away as if frightened. But no. Can't you see how you've changed? Would your true name fit you any longer? She pauses, putting her hands to her cheeks. The corpse bites her lower lip. You see, you can let your old name go now. Become something new. But who? What name? She appears confused, overwhelmed. Anything you like, anything. She stands quietly for a time, staring at the floor. Suddenly she raises her head. You name, name me. Hmm, all right. I guess I can just pick a name for her. Okay, let's think up something interesting. Updated my journal. Ooh, 5,000 experience, hell yeah. You think of a name, but before you can speak it, the zombie hushes you, drawing close and cupping a hand over her ear. You whisper the name to her. The corpse nods, then smiles. Yes, thank you. Of course. There is a long pause. Urgh. The zombie shrugs, one of her shoulders not quite rising as high as the other. Ask Mary still. Oh, freaking. Yeah, not gonna tell me anything different, are you? I'm gone. I think we checked all those out. Skeleton. I believe we went down there. Antichamber. Dang it. That really does look like a doorway right there. 
All right. I'm gone. Nope. I'm gone. Done. Uh, maybe there's something new. Healing. Uh. Uh. That's different. I don't remember that before. But I need per his permission to leave. I don't remember that. Well, let's ask it. Oh, it holds up its palm. No. By the power of the silent king, thou shalt not leave this place. What can I do to convince you? Oh, considers you for a moment before speaking. Prove to the dead nations that thou mean it no harm. Acts of good will. Perhaps then I shall take thy petition to the silent king. I seem to recall we promised Pharaoh that we would not tell. Eh. Someone you need slain. Task I can perform. Uh, what about a task? Updated my journal. Yes, perhaps. Occasionally the ghouls will miss small packs of well-hidden cranium rats that have come here to that have come to spy here. Shouldst thou come across any, be sure to slay them. Huh. Okay. <laughs> Journal. Ah. Okay. Look around for cranium rats. Did I look in there? Yeah. Well, let's go looking around for these. Here, ready, ready, readies. Locked. Yeah. I'm gone. Hinged. Am I like... I really miss being able to just hit tab and find out where all the doors are. Alright. Why can't I get in there? Locked. Great. Cranian wraps, but where? Done. They aren't like hiding up. <laughs> Holy I'm freaking gone. crap! Oh god! Holy. Oh my. Why does the Cranian wraps fire crap at me? Uh, Alright. Quickly, kill! Come on, kill him, buddy! Damn it! Oh, woo! Come on, pick it up. I'll take that. Done. Sure. I'm gone. Now let's just keep on collecting these things. Come on, last one. Whew. 
All right. All right, let's take that back to Hargrim here. Questions? Yeah, I found and killed a group of cranium rats in the rubble of an old passageway. Updated my journal. Sweet. It nods, obviously pleased. Thou have our thanks. May the Silent King watch over thee. So, can you speak to the Silent King for me now? Sweet, I shall carry the request to the Silent King. The Silent King has spoken. Thou art free to go. Thy way no longer be barred. Updated Looks my like journal. My skills have increased. Yay. Morty leveled up. Two hit points. Now he has 56. Excellent. I think this deserves a quick save. Was I ever able to get Locked. into that? Oh. Forced it. Open. Sweet. Bone charm. All right. Uh, let's change our weapon back. Done. Oh, come on. Done. Done. Cool. Got six of these things now. Done. I'm gone. Ooh. Man, she's creepy. I oh, we still need to get this stinking knife from this guy. I want your stinking knife, man. I got a head. Why won't you take my... Hey... Jeez, it was a stinking rat tails? Okay, have the rat tails. Yes, yes! The ghoul snatches them away greedily and devours them. After licking his clawed fingers clean, he tosses you Uhir's knife. Hmm. Hey, look at that! Michael Jackson, is that you? I'm gone. Done. Guess that's not the exit. Is this the exit? Junk, rags, bandages. We still don't know what these things do. Done. Wait, where's the stinking exit? Okay, there it is. Wait a minute, which one actually is the exit? Drowned Nation's Catacombs, or Back to the Weeping Stone Catacombs. Okay. I'm gone. I think we want to go back. Ah, yes. Alright. I mean, in reality, we want to get out of here. Oh my... Crap. Done. I don't think we have a choice, guy. Gotta take him on. Damn. Holy crap. Kill it. Like deaths come for the bill. You know, I was just sitting here wondering whether you were gonna get up. And well, you have oh to go spoil my fun. Well, that's one way to get back to the entrance. Alright, let's get out of here. Locked. Ah, jeez, come on, open the dang gate. Yep.
I'm gone. All right. Say, do you think we're actually gonna make it out of this place this time? Is there any other exits? Quint. Nope. All right. I guess I don't have a choice. Quick save. me in again. I'm hurt. Ah, talk about beating a dead horse. Dang it. Done. Wait, the exit was here, right? Is it possible I can actually kill my way out of this? Let's try that one more time. Oh. Well, actually, what about if I sneak over here? Oh, man. Bronze bell, huh? Door. Ooh. Oh yeah. I'm gone. Exit. Show me the exit. All right. Keep on running, guys. Oh man. Done. Yeesh. Yeesh. Oh my goodness. This place is crawling with All guys. Alright, All right, I think we're almost to the exit. Please don't become enemies. Just coming through, guys. Just coming through. Yes. Run. Okay, yes. Throw the junk in there. Done. Oh, yeah. I'm gone. Okay, this definitely deserves a quick save. All right, we are in Rack Picture Square. Midwife's Hut. I think we should explore. Exactly where is this hut? Huh. Uh, thought I saw a door. Tower looks like it was built to hold rainwater. It says it's right there. All right. Oh, okay. All right. What do we got in here? Number of herbs are hanging from the rack to dry. Old Mebeth. This squat old woman looks like, like she has had all the color bled out of her. Everything from her hair to her shawl to her robe, all are shades of gray. The only splotches of color on her come from several strange herbs, which are tied to her belt by their stalks. The herbs make a strange swish when she moves like a broom. Top of the morning to you, lady. The elderly woman turns and stares at you. 
and you notice the gray shades blanketing her body extend to her features as well. Her hair is a wispy gray, and her eyes are like chips of granite. She frowns when she sees you. And who might ye be, hmm? I really don't know who I am. So ye not know yourself, child. She squints, then points at your chest. Hard to piece together the man beneath all that tracery and scrawling scars, is it? Maybe. Who are you? With a sly cackle, she wags her eyebrows. Have ye not heard of old Mebethin, the midwife of the square? Have ye not now? She narrows her eyes and her voice drops. Well, now, ye have, for I at B. Mebeth. You're a midwife. What do you do? Updated my journal. I set bones right. Drive the cough out of the sick. Yank out squealing, stubborn babies. Mend cloaks or a rag or two. Make cures and herbs and other such. She squints at you, studying your scars. Be needing a cure or three, do you then? Cures? Aye. You be needing some cures to look at you. Do you want to buy some, do you? She glances at the scars covering your body again, then shrugs. Too late to be asking for them, I think. Huh. Actually, we could. Yeah, I guess we could use some healing. But Mebeth nods. Very well, then. She reaches for one of the dried herbs at her belt, snaps it off at the stalk, then grinds it in her callous palms. Small wisps of dust and pollen rise from her hands. She then mumbles to herself, then the blows the dust into the air. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Updated my journal. Oh. The gray pollen swirls around the room, blanketing you and your companions. You breathe deeply, and less than a moment later, you feel strangely refreshed. Thanks, Mebeth. Before I go, I had some other questions for you. Go on and ask them. Missing a journal. Do you know where I can find it? Mebeth thinks. Haven't seen one. If it's in the square, which I doubt, since folks don't traffic much with books and the like, it's most likely been sold or stolen. Was it something important to you, then? A magic thingy, all glowing and sparkling with magic, sir? Eh? If so, you might never see it again. <laughs> Maybe not. Something else. What do you sell here, Mebeth? I sell rags and herbs and cures and charms and mixes and pulse, poultices and all that wash. She shrugs. Also, if you find a queer item you can't figure out, bring it to Mebeth. No promises, child, but mayhap I can riddle out what it is. Alright, what do you sell? Needle and thread. Premium rat charm. Cockroach charm. Bandages. Scroll of remove curse. Ah, identify, okay. Alright, uh. Could I rest here? She nods. Of course, child. I have a mess of blankets in the corner that would serve. That would be fine, thank you. Oh. Hmm. I didn't exactly really need to rest. You feel... You wake, feeling refreshed. Mammoth is putting around the hut, but she turns when she hears you stir. Awake, are you? Ye slept like the dead. She smiles. Do no dreams stir ye head? Ah, uh, you know, I didn't have any dreams at all. Mebeth shrugs. Nothing odd about that. Most dreams are shy, then fly when the sleeper's lids open. No, but it doesn't feel like I forgot them. I don't think I dreamed anything. It feels wrong. Mebeth chews that over, then shrugs. Dreams can make men great, but they have laid low just as many. Mayhap you're better off without net them nettling ye. 
Mayhap, but I don't think so. Updated my journal. Hmm. Men of the snorts. Well, dreams or no, I'm not one to change the nature of a man. Have ye slept enough? Okay, yeah, thanks. I have some other questions. Are you a <laughs> Are you a witch, Mebeth? Mebeth scrutinizes you. I say not as to what I am and isn't, but what you be wanting to know so full bad for that ye hound an old woman, barking and sniffing for a juicy bit of gossip. <gasps> Ooh. I want to learn about magic. Can you teach me? Mebeth laughs. Ha! I'm no teacher, no school mistress all set up to teach like them in the big fest hall. There's others somewhere I'm sure that'll spill the dark of it. You'd be wasting your time with old Mebeth, so ye would. Ah, oh, no. I don't agree. I think you'd have a lot to teach. Ooh. Mebeth looks at you intently. Oh, I. Why do you want to learn such a thing? Because I need it, I may need it to solve the mystery of who I am. After a moment, Mebeth nods. The art may help, it may not, and you must not rely on it to solve all your problems. She sighs. Child, it's most like only going to add another chip to your pile of questions. I understand. Will you teach me? Bah! Mebeth shakes her head. One should make songs rather than make magic. Songs have more beauty. Magic's been made dull, commonplace, soiled by the mob of people that have tromped through it. Hmm. She squints at you. I'll teach ye, but first you need to do some things for me. You hear? Uh, Freaking fetch quests. Like what? My legs aren't good for walking about sigil, and there's errands I've have ye run. I need you to fetch me some herbs from the market. It's Spire Ward, easterly, southerly from here, in the hive market. Here's a sample. She takes a black seed from her coat and flicks it to you. It Spire Ward, easterly, southerly, okay. Updated my journal. Examine the seed. You twist the black seed in your hand. As you do, you feel a small bite. Then a small drop of blood oozes from your thumb. There are tiny barbs on the seed, like teeth. Mebeth snorts. Careful with it. Show it to one of the fruit merchants at the market. They will know what herbs you seek. Alright. Sweet. She'll turn me into a mage. Oh, it's dark. All right, well, done. Exit. Not the exit. Kill it. Sweet. All right. Rat charms. Come All on. right. Anything in here? Nope. Rats. Where is the exit? Okay, it's up, up in this direction somewhere. Picker Square, Flop House. Um, where was I supposed to go? A few blocks south and east of her hut. Okay. Where am I, like, on the full map? Maybe if I keep going this way and then go south? Done. 
Hmm. All right. Okay, here we go. All right. Hive thug. Okay, right. we are back to where we started. Done. Let's try heading south. Okay. Um, what do we have here? Warehouse? Ah, the Smoldering Corpse Bar. Fell's Tattoo Parlor. Done. Well. Angry Hive Dweller. Let's head into the bar. Whoa. Ignis. Done. Drusella, who are you? This is a woman with fading bruises on her face and arms and a look of disparaging longing in her sunken eyes. She might have been pretty once, but those days were long, long ago. She turns slowly to face you. Life pours into her features and the spark of sardonic light that dances in her eyes now makes you wonder if her eyes, if, no, if your eyes were deceiving you. Welcome to the smoldering corpse, scarred man. Who are you? I, I am Drusella, and you must be clueless. Don't ask me how I know that. It just shines off you. Clueless? I think not. She smirks at you, and her bruises seem almost to fade. Whatever you say, dearie. Whatever. Answer some questions for me. Aye, traveler, what is it you seek? Who are you? Ah. Huh. Okay, well, let's go with the other answer. Shines right. Answer me some questions. I'm looking for a journal. Would you happen to have seen it? A journal? Oh, sure. I've kept an eye out for all stray journals, just in case some scarred man walks into my favorite bar and starts asking me about it. Do you ask that of everyone you meet? What a fascinating life. Ooh, that's... <laughs> you have a smart mouth on you, don't you? I a smart mouth for a smart head. I ain't the addle cove you might think, Sod. I got a brain on me. If you're so smart, you should be able to answer my questions. Okay, what can you tell me about this place? Here? This is the smoldering corpse, though the person smoldering ain't dead yet. He's just keeping himself alive until someone comes along to help him out. Sods who like to see people in pain come here. Fiends like it. Folks who don't much care for being bothered come up here, too. The name alone keeps out most of the Burks. Who is he, anyway? Updated my journal. That despair you saw in her face before flirts across it again like a black wing shadow before she, before she masters herself. That's Ignis, one of the greatest wizards ever to come out of this slummy excuse for a cesspool. They caught him... And they opened him, opened a channel to the plane of fire through him, and now he's just the doorway for it, keeping himself alive by force of will alone. If someone could douse him for a few moments, it'd give him his life back again. But they don't make enough water to do that. Huh? Someone should go to. What's your connection to him? Her voice practically throbs with a deep ache. I was Ignis's lover and he my beloved. He loved the flame more than me and now he has become the flame. And because I love him, I love the flame. But that's all done with now. Now I wait for him to douse himself. I sell what little I have just so I can be near him. Jeez. Okay, burning guy in the entryway. No, I guess I'm not going to get anything different. I guess that's it. 
Can I talk to this guy? Ooh. This crackling, billowing creature twists slowly above an iron grill upon the floor of the bar. It may have once been human, but now its skin is charred beyond recognition. Streams of fire form a wreath around the creature's body, and the flames lick at the few remaining pockets of flesh, causing them to bubble and run like wax down the creature's skeletal frame. Well, let's just examine them. The heat surrounding this creature is incredible. To your surprise, the iron grill the creature floats above has sagged and bent from the heat. At first you thought the heat came from the grill, but now you realize it emanates from the creature. As you watch, flecks of ash drift from the writhing corpse and float slowly to the ceiling. Hey. The thing makes no response. It rises slowly within the flames. It lives. But it does not seem aware of anything other than the fire that surrounds it. Its skin is flame, its heart is flame, and you know, within some shadowed corner of your memory, that thing is dangerous. Okay. I'm gone. Alright. Oh? Mercy Killer Patron. What the hell is that? Hello, O. Oh. You see a man, standing stock still. He isn't moving a muscle. On closer examination, it appears that he isn't even breathing, just standing. His eye sockets are empty holes in his face. Contained within their bounds is a flat, gray light that seems to dance with possibility. Looking into the sockets, the eerie, empty feeling of a limitless void shivers through you, as if you had gazed into the sliver of eternity. The head slowly swivels toward you. You notice that no muscles appear to have to move under his skin as he turns, and he speaks in a pure, bell-like tone. Well met, Wanderer. You have forgotten again, haven't you? Do you know me, stranger? As he opens his mouth, you get the feeling of eternity again. Inside his mouth you see no tongue, no teeth. It's almost as if this man were a shell surrounding an illimitable expanse. I have spoken with you before, and always you forget. Your endless quest to discover yourself ends always in your amnesia. You draw close to the truth and recoil. Let us hope that you have the strength to endure your existence. What do you know of me? I know that you, like a fly, rise up from the wreckage of your old shell, buzz about for a time, and then curl up and die at the window of truth. You bumble about the pain, seeking the light without any plan to your actions, and fall exhausted when you fail. You alight on others to feed from them for a time and move on with no regard to them. I have watched you come here and listen to your words, and watched you move away no wiser. Will you learn from your mistakes, Seeker? <laughs> Not this time. Who are you? I am O. For some reason, when he speaks this name, it sounds like he's speaking of much more than a single letter, as if the speaking of his name contained untold possibilities and nuances. No human tongue could ever create such a sound. What sort of name is that? It is my name. It is the name of a portion of eternity. I am a letter in the divine alphabet. Understanding me leads to understanding existence. I am writ in the true names of half of everything. My being encompasses truth. I am mathematic, organic, metaphysic. So what does that mean? The divine alphabet is writ in the name of everything that exists, from the sea at the hearts of the elemental plane to the core of the great beyond. My brothers, sisters, a single word translate in, into the two in your mind, and I reach across all that is, was, or ever shall be. We are thought and reality and concept and the unimaginable. Okay, tell me about the great beyond. You would not understand. No mortal possibly could. It is beyond the powers of comprehension of all but the most powerful of powers, and once they understand, they move beyond the veil of mortal comprehension. 
I can explain it no more than that. Perhaps sometime you will understand. So what are you doing here? Why, I am watching the ebb and flow of mortality. And what do you see? You mortals are like wasps. You build your lives' nests from the slimmest of branches, and when the wind shakes your home life free, you seek to sting the wind to death. Instead of realizing your foolish mistakes, attempting to repair the damage you have caused yourselves, and learning from your experience, you bring harm to any who have the misfortune to blunder near you in your time of pain and distress. My advice to you, and to all mortals, Stop acting like an insect and start acting sentient. <laughs> I'll think about that. I'm looking for a journal. It's urgent. Do you know where I might find it? I know where you can find it. But it is not my place to reveal such information. For a stupid freaking... Rest assured, you will find it. As well as the man you seek. What do you know of that? I know that your journal takes you far beyond your journal quest, to the very edges of existence. You will struggle for your life and your very spirit, and I do not tell you any more regarding this. Okay. Oh, tell me of the patrons of this tavern. The patrons of this place are varied, yet all mortal. Like all mortals, their concerns are limited, with the potential of blossoming into actual truth. I can tell you this though, you may find a companion dear to your heart here. At least as dear as your heart will allow. Thank you. Companion. Companion. Yes. Um... Basically, who's got a name? Name. Well, those guys got a name. Well, I guess we're just gonna be talking to everybody. Let's talk to this guy first. Dakon. The man before you is old. His dry, yellow skin has the scars of one who has traveled everywhere and never rested long in any one place. His pinched face is inhumanly angular, and his ears swept out from his skull, tapered to points. He wears a loose-fitting orange tunic, and a strange shimmering blade is strapped across his back. The blade looks to be a two-pronged gl glaive made of some metal whose surface swirls like a flim of oil on a pond. Hello. The man turns to you, his eyes like polished coal. He stares through you, and for a moment, you wonder if he might be blind. The weapon suddenly turns a dead, flat black, mirroring the man's eyes. You okay? Hail, traveler. Ooh, he speaks. He says nothing for a moment, merely searching your face with his eyes. Hail, traveler. His voice is quiet and somber, like a wind whispering through the branches of a great tree. Hail. Your eyes are the weight of one who has traveled far to be in this place. Oh. The man's... The man meets your gaze, his eyes burrowing into yours. His weapon drains of its black color, resuming its shimmering. You notice before you spoke to him, and then he said what he just said. You could say that. The man's gaze does not waver from yours. I am known as Dakon. The emphasis he places on the word known strikes you as odd, yet familiar at the same time. You are not known to me. <laughs> I do not know myself. That is for the best, in knowing yourself. There would be little in the plains left worth knowing. He falls silent for a moment, still studying you with his cold black eyes. I would know why you have come to the city. I'm looking for answers. I have many questions. <sighs> Speak your questions. I will hear you. Your features are unfamiliar to me. What are you? A, uh, a gift Zeri. A gift Zeri? A gift Zeri is one of the people. <laughs> one of the people? A, a gift. Yes, but what are the gift Zeri exactly? 
Dacon is silent for a moment, then speaks. Our history does not need to be made known to you. We would bleed to death on time's blade before I recited a fraction of the histories of our people. I don't need to know your histories, but I would know of your people as they are now. Dacon is silent for a moment. Know this and accept it as an answer. We are the people who make our home upon the shifting plane of limbo. With a deft motion, Dacon slips the blade from his back and holds it before him. Let's see what happens. Hmm. There, we mold the matter of limbo with our minds. We forge cities with our thoughts. As you watch, a series of rippling waves of metal begin to roll forth from the center of the blade. The pitch and crest of the waves match the inflections in Dakon's voice. In its chaos, we delve with our only knowing to preserve us. We are the gift of Zeri. What is that blade you have? It moved, shifted in response to your voice. It is a carriage blade. It is an object that lets others know the rank of the wielder. Carriage, what does that mean? Dakon falls silent for a moment, as if searching for the correct words. In your tongue, the closest translation is chaos matter. The people may shape it with their thoughts. Okay. Shaped with your thoughts. Carrick is not shaped by heat, but by knowing oneself. It is a mirror that reflects the will of the wielder on its surface and in its edge. When one knows themselves, the blade is strong, harder, and stronger than steel. When one does not know themselves, the blade is water, formless and weak. Are you willing to sell it? What rank does the blade signify? The blade is a symbol carried by the Zerth. A Zerth is one who knows the words of Zerthamon. And knowing the words of Zerthamon, they know themselves. Zerthamon? Zerthamon founded our race. He knew the Gazeri before they knew themselves. He defied the people. De defined the people, not defied. He gave them one mind. Let's see if he's willing to sell it. Oh, it would become as nothing in the hands of another. The blade knows my mind, and I know its heart. We die the same death. Mm, okay. Okay, can you tell me about this city? It is known by the name Sigil. Among the people, it is known as a city that does not know itself. It does not know itself? What do you mean? The city exists, but it does not know itself. And not knowing itself, its existence is flawed. How is it flawed? Oh, wow. The city exists in opposition to itself. It has set itself apart from the plains, yet it seeks to be everywhere at once. Its walls are doors, yet it keeps these doors locked. Such an existence tells of a thing that does not know itself. In not knowing itself, it is flawed. Oh, jeez. What if the city is not flawed? A thing does not need to be ordered to have a purpose to know itself. What if these contradictions are strengths that you cannot see? Huh. Uh... Contradictions cannot see. Wait a minute. Alright, well, well, let's just see what happens. What if the city is not flawed and you just do not know the reasons for its contradictions? There is order in everything. Perhaps there is an underlying pattern that you cannot perceive. To your question, a question. What if the city is flawed and you see its contradictions all around you? Man. To your question, a question. You claim the city's existence is flawed. You have accepted this rather than explore the possibility that something greater may exist. That suggests you are flawed, and that you do not search for knowledge 
but only for a convenient answer. Dakon falls silent. There is no knowing the answer to the questions we have asked, yet the city exists, that is all. Yet I would maintain that we know ourselves by the questions we ask and the ones we do not. If we cease asking questions and accept only what we can perceive. Hey, I got some experience. Then we will cease to know ourselves. Dakon's voice has changed slightly, become heavier. Such words have been spoken before. I have heard them and know them. Where have you heard them? The words are mine. Once I knew them and knew their meaning. I had forgotten them until you spoke. Dakon's gaze travels through you, and his blade stops shimmering, bleeding of all color until it is translucent. There is a moment of silence, then Dakon looks up at you. I would travel your path with you. Hey, hey, hey. Sure. Sweet. I accept an extra blade will be welcome. Your path is mine. Strangely enough, his voice seems distant, and it echoes if, as if he was speaking from across a vast, a great distance. Very well, let's go. I feel stronger. Did I just level up? Oh. Sweet. Level up. Uh, armor class 9, 53 hit points. <laughs> Genius level intelligence. Can boost. Um, charisma, constitution, what should I boost, what should I boost? We're going to leave strength alone. Charisma, um, Wisdom. High Wisdom helps you recall memories and gives you a bonus to experience points. Heroic proportions. Alright, let's let's go with that. So Endure. What is our little friend Enduring here? Grow strong. He is a fighter mage. Level 3. Seventeen strength. He's definitely a better fighter than he is a mage. Armor class two. I'm the one with a terrible armor class. Done. Sweet. Alright. You see a soft... Oh. Ahem. <clears throat> Kandarian. You see a soft-looking man with gentle, far-staring eyes. He dresses in supple leather, clothing, and carries various implements of use and destruction about his body such as ropes, spikes, tender boxes, and empty vials of air. He looks half gnome, literally. There's a insubstantiality to his existence, as if his essence has been partially leached away. He focuses those eyes on you, and suddenly you find them gripping and determined. Greetings to you, O Seeker. Hello. He carefully sets down the mug he's holding and gives you all his attention. I have seen the far reaches of the multiverse and returned to tell the tale. I have walked upon the bodies of dead gods and spun moonbeams in the astral ahead of a thousand shrieking Githyanki knights. 
I have passed the edges of existence and watched my essence shiver away before me. What is it I can do for you? Questions. Perhaps I have answers for you. Speak, and I shall tell them to you. Oh. Hey. I met a woman named Ingress with very bad teeth. She said she had come through a portal from some world that, that was opened by a tune hummed near two cross trees. Can you get her home? He pauses briefly thinking. I know the portal of which you speak, though I have not traveled it these thirty years gone. I will take her home, seeker. Go tell her to w await my arrival. Then meet me back here and I will tell you if I was successful or not. Updated my cool. journal. Who are you? I am Kendarian Illborn, traveler, dreamer, tale spinner, and so forth. Tell me of the plains, good sir. I am tired, seeker, so tired. I am fresh back from negotiation. No, oh, negation? I will answer what I can for you, but I cannot promise that you will find satisfaction in the answers I give. What would you know? Would you hear of the outer planes, the prime material, or the inner planes? That's what's the difference? Woohoo! The difference is true essence seeker. The inner planes are matter, substance, true physicality. They are the building blocks of the multiverse, for it is from then that all belief in the elements springs. The inner planes filter through the erythral plane, the plane of potential, some say which forms the elements into the worlds of mortals. Once past the erythral plane, one reaches the prime material, where exist all manner of mortals and monsters and myths and machines. It is there that belief is born, and there that the spirits that create the outer planes are born. When mortals die, they pass through the astral plane, a no place that is thought and mental energy itself. It is in all things and in none. It is paradox, among other things, and it filters spirits into the great ring. Do you comprehend so far? Ugh, yeah. Ugh, oh, yes, okay, now the outer planes. Where should I start? Do you know the cardinal rules of the planes on which all others are based? Do you know how the composition of the outer planes? Do you know of the great ring and its divisions in our hearts? Do you know of the individual planes? Each of these leads to the next, and so it is best to start from the beginning. Oh. Oh, just another time. <laughs> how about this guy? Eb Creek Knees. You see a slightly stooped old man with a full gray beard and a lion's mane of gray hair. He wears a couple of shoulder guards as armor, and he keeps a helmet nearby. He smokes a pipe and carries a pouch of tobacco around his waist. He looks pretty strong, but he's a little plump and also where it appears to have some sort of breathing trouble. Well now, aren't you a sight, lad? Never have I seen so many scars blanketing a fella, like a scar cloak you're wearing. Where you been? Hanging out in a grain thresher? He laughs. Oh, I'm just jesting with you, lad. No offense meant, and I hope no offense taken. I'm Eb. He extends his hand. Well, greetings, Eb. His handshake is firm. Now, I hereby tender my apologies for the unfair jesting, lad. Hope no hard feelings. Can I buy you a tankard or two of something to soothe any ruffled feathers? Sure, why not? That's the spirit lad. Bite a moment. He rises to his feet and heads to the bar. After a moment, he returns to his seat with a pair of tankards. Here you go, lad. Drink up. He takes a massive swallow from his own tankard, puffs on his pipe, and says, What can old Eb do for you on this fine sigil day? Questions, please. Oh, well, I gathered that. Just to look at you. I mean, you don't look like you're from around these parts, lads. You look a little too out of sorts to be a seasoned native. Eb chuckles, then takes another drink. So what can I help you with, lad? You need to know where the lay of the land? Eb winks. Who are you? Eb Creeknees, third measure of the harm harmonium? 
now retired and being a tout with one's voice since I don't step as lightly as I might these past two or three decades. He chuckles. Now, lad, who be you and what trouble might you be in? Third measure of the harmonium? Oh. Ebb puffs up slightly in pride and gets a semi-stern look on his face. Aye. Third measure of the harmonium. He relaxes a little. Though I haven't served a tour of duty in many a decade. Pushing a quill wasn't quite up my alley after all the fights and skirmishes I've been in. So I just bide my time keeping tabs on things down here in the hive and helping out a little where I can. And you look like someone who might need a hand. Are you in some kind of trouble, lad? Hmm. A few troubles. I woke up in the mortuary and seem to have forgotten who I am. Eh? Ed blinks and frowns. What was that you said, lad? That you woke up in the mortuary? Ebb studies you closely. Oh now, did they mistake you for dead under all them scars, mayhap? Ebb chuckles. Can't say I would have been any smarter. He puffs his pipe. Them dusties. He catches himself. I mean, them dustmen. Dusties being a rude term to refer to them pale-faced fellas. And I don't mean them too much disrespect. They have all the perceptions and friendliness of a gravestone sometimes, eh? Can't say I couldn't see them so screwing that up, no lad. That's what I've heard. I've had I had some other questions. I'm missing a journal. You're missing a journal? Was there more to the journal than just pages and words? Otherwise, I can't imagine too many bloods who would bother themselves with letters unless it was really hot and spicy. Not much use for books and learning around here. I don't know where you might find such a thing. It puffs on his pipe. Then he snaps his fingers. But you know, lad, if Ferret is the one who scraped you off the sigil street, then he might know the dark of where your stuff is. It's most likely in his larder, if you ask me. A dead man is usually in no position to keep his possessions when the collectors tumble across his body. I don't think we need to ask him about Farad. Uh, what other places can you recommend? Well, Ebb puffs on his pipe and studies you. This is perhaps the best kip you could have wandered into from the start. Judging by your tattoos, you might be partial to having designs on your body. In which case, there's a tattoo salon a little spyward from here. You want to stay away from the alley of dangerous angles if you can. Ignis torched that place not long ago, and ever since, a bunch of bad bloods have set up their kip in that stretch of desert. Uh, I wonder if you can tell me something... What makes you think I'm in trouble? Lad, no one has as many scars as you have and isn't it in some sort of trouble, either from himself or from others. Ebb looks at you in mock reproach. What do you take old Ebb for, blind? Ha! Look, I'm a little weathered around the edges, but I've still got some sight and sense. Now what's dodging your heels to be causing such trouble? Mayhap I can help you. Well. All right. Mercy Killer. Let's talk to this guy. You see a short, rotund man with a perplexed expression on his face. From the lines on his loose skin, it looks like it's not too uncommon. He carries a flagoon of ale that looks like it's in the process of being emptied rapidly. In between swallows, he speaks in a gentle voice, so quiet that you can barely hear his words. Hello, traveler. My name is... Illquix. Illquick. Ill something or other. Can I be of some assistance to you? Sure. What do you know want to know, my friend? Who exactly are you? I I am a humble man with a slight flowery poetical bent and tendency toward the supernatural. I regret that I have none of my supplies here. Or I should be most, most eager to teach you of the ways of power. Perhaps some time later. Yes, I'd like that for now, though I have some other questions. Who's a Bernie man? That, uh, that is the last unfortunate 
who chose to exercise his individual will without the strength to back up his desires. His name is Ignis, and he is was a pyromaniac. He burned and burned, didn't burn the right people, and wound up channeling more raw power than he could control. Now, well, you can see what became of him. If you wish to learn more of him, perhaps that poor creature, Drusilla, can help you. Other questions? I don't think he can help me. What about these things? Huh. You see a scaled fiend who looks very similar to the one standing next to him. In addition to the pierced left ears, both are black-hued and reptilian, with bat wings tucked against themselves. This one is missing a tooth on its right side. Ah, Tegari, it says. Our old friend has returned to pay us a visit. So he has. Athlagrin, so he has. Yet his eyes do not gleam as once they did. What do you suppose brings him back to us? What does bring you back to us, friend? Uh, who are you? Ah, Athlagrin. Athlagrin. Time has robbed our companion's memory. You honestly do not recall us, do you? Truly I am aggrieved, but as am I, Tegrin. Truly aggrieved, yet I rest easy. It has, after all, been many hundreds of years, and we know how the minds of mortals tend to dissipate with age. Ah, well spoken, old friend. We are a pair of a bishai on leave from our current assignments in Bador. I'm Tethgarin. The Thrice Damned, so named for my ability to find the best in every situation. This is Athlogrin, who has earned himself no special name, though not for lack of trying. <laughs> lack of trying? What do you mean? Athlogrin ignores you as a response to its companion. And once again, Telgarin. Telgarin, you have cut straight to the truth of the matter, though perhaps it is best not to have earned the sort of notice one bearing the name Thrice Damned must surely have incurred. Ugh. What is this? Mort whispers to you, boss. I don't like this. They're not supposed to be here. The Blood War hasn't kicked the Celestials' asses bad enough that any fiend can go on furlough. They want something. Tread carefully. In the meantime, Tagaren continues to respond to his companion. In its turn, Tagaren ignores you as it replies to its comrade. Once again, I maintain that any notice is better than notice at all. The Abishai turns back to you. Old friend, does this answer your question as to our identities? I suppose it will have to. Farewell. Yes, because I need to put a cut in this episode right now. Well, we got a lot farther. We actually made it out of that stinking catacomb. We got a new companion. I hear your words. And we, we got a quest to hopefully learn some magic. We shall see next time, guys. Quick save here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you then. Bye-bye.